How are you all doing this morning? I may have told you last time, the first 30 years of my life I spent in India, my golden tan gives me away. And I uh, came to Texas, lived 11 years here, and uh, about 10 years in North Carolina, so my English is a little mixed up, and I talk fast too. Uh, Ask me which was the hardest language of all, Texan. I'm still learning it. So honored to be here. Thank you for the opportunity to come back and uh, share with you what God is doing around the world, especially among the persecuted church. And I uh, want to thank uh, my friends, uh, Sharon and her parents. Without them, I would not have been introduced to this church. We appreciate you so greatly, your friendship and your heart for missions. And um, um, with all that you went through, Hurricane Harvey and um, the devastation that it caused, um, I want to let you know, folks, your pastor and you as a church did not stop one check from coming in as far as missions is concerned. And I know during difficult times, churches don't do that, even larger churches. I want to tell you there's an applause in heaven, not only now. When you get into heaven, there'll be a big thank you for standing with the persecuted church. And I want to thank Pastor William and Miss Lisa and the whole family and the ministry that they do here. And... Uh, great time. The band, everything is fantastic here. So let's give God the glory for all the things God is doing here. Sometimes we need to pat ourselves and God says, hey, keep on doing the great work that you're doing. The world needs people that would bring the healing power of Jesus. And we are the people who have it. We have the living hope only we can give. As I'm speaking, um, I just returned from India Spent a week there, which was not a planned trip. Um, and my dad, he's um, unofficially nearly 84. Um, I told you last time, one of my, he is my hero, the greatest man I've ever met personally. Great faith, ordinary man, great faith. Left his home, a Christian south with about 20% Christians, a tropical paradise. He was from a middle class farming family. Left his home, left his family, friends, came all the way three days and three nights by train to a state where we are headquartered, less than one half of 1% Christians, headquarter of radical Hinduism. And that's a word that is not heard much. You think all Indians do yoga and they're very peaceful. Go and, you know, there's an app called Times of India, read the newspaper. There's all kinds of things. We have a history of violence and now nationalism at a growing pace in the midst of all that. God has protected us. And my dad, you know, we struggled 18 to 20 years without much result, went hungry to bed many times. My parents could have picked their family, gotten back to the south to the safety of their home, three decent meals for their children, but they stayed put because of the Great Commission, lost a two-year-old child because of lack of medical care, my sister. And, um, and he has baptized more than 7,000 people in the last 15 to 17 years. He baptized more people in the last... And not in fancy baptistries. He goes to the village. There are mud houses. There's an emerging economy in India. But what doesn't make the news is the 800 million. There's 1.3 billion people, by the way. So we are one too many. One out of seven people on earth. You've got to like me anyhow. So, <laughs> um, but, uh, um, so um, about seven to 800 million people make then less than five, two to five dollars a day. And that's the people my dad goes to, sleeps in mud houses, goes to ponds where they wash clothes, bathe. And I baptized a long time ago, so, um, you know, my, my feet is kosher. And um, he would go preach for five hours, then take a bunch of people, 50 to 100, baptize them. His feet would go ankle deep in the mud, and then they would pull him out, and he would go to the next village the next day and do the same for two weeks at a time. Was a diabetic, never took care of his health. And always, you know, I want to die on the mission field. So we tried hard to keep him home, but uh, he wanted to be on the go, and his legs don't work anymore for the last nine months. He has not walked much. And as we speak, after a prolonged stay at the hospital, he's brought home. So it's days and maybe weeks, barring a miracle. So we appreciate your prayers, Pastor. You prayed with me this morning. But guess what? You know, we got to keep going. My dad would still say, you know, don't, you know, Finney, there's... You know, there's a lot more people to be reached with the gospel. And he would tell me, keep going. And he, you know, through all the challenges, 
you know, that we went through. It's very hard for you to imagine what we went through. Um, and uh, he would just, you know, he would always say, I crush the devil under my feet, I keep going. You know, that's what he always said. And, um, and, and what a legacy he has left, and I'm, we are just blessed because of him. We appreciate that. My wife of 31 years is here, and uh, God has blessed us with three children. And you gave us a short break. Uh, thank you, church, for uh, we can spend a, two or three days, and I'm going to travel back again to India. And uh, the best thing that has ever happened to me is my granddaughter. So if you are on Facebook, Finney Matthews is my name. And, uh, and um, when I post about ministry, I hardly get any likes. <laughs> when I post my beautiful granddaughter, it goes viral. So just want to let you know. Michelle's was in jeopardy. You got to really applaud me for being here because I want to be with my granddaughter. That's, that's, all, that's all I think about. Thank God for FaceTime, isn't it? Isn't, isn't that great? Um, is the children ready? It's, it's beautiful to watch that. I want you to watch that. Charles, thank you. that I can I've seen it up at least 25 times in imagine the joy that they have they're singing the blind saw the lame walked Jesus did great things while he was on this earth and they are jumping and dancing and praising the Lord and the circumstances around them is really grim so this is the northeast part of India bordering Myanmar by God's grace, what started with two bags of clothes, a vision, a bicycle, and a Bible for 22 years, that's what my parents had, has spread to more than 13 states of India. Persecution is on the rise. We've gone to over 10 nations now with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Only God could have done it. But these children live on the border of Myanmar, formerly Burma, and India. There's a lot of cross-border drug trafficking, which results in, uh, you know, there are a lot of drugs they take, reuse syringes, causes AIDS. So many of these parents, their parents have AIDS. And um, human trafficking because there's abject poverty there. And if you look at this, uh, they're on the dirt floor. And then behind them is a school made out of bamboos and metal sheets. That's all that they have. But they still have the joy of the Lord. That is amazing. And part of the story is is the generosity that we don't talk about how America impacts the world. All, about half of these children, 50 of them, are sponsored by people like you. $30 a month helps the, those children to be sponsored. We are able to minister not only to the children and keep them in school and educated, but minister to their parents and bring them to Christ. It's a really a powerful ministry. We call it Giving Children Hope. And we have some children back on the table. If you want us, some of you have already sponsored. Last time when I came, we appreciate that so much. But there are more children out there that are waiting. If the Lord would lead on your heart, you know, just a visit to the restaurant um, will help them one month in helping them uh, stay in school and learn the Word of God and have a better future. So please be thinking about that. And we have a couple of pastors. As I said, persecution is growing in India. They're clamping down. Ministries like Compassion International, we've been in India for about uh, 48 years. It's a large ministry helping children. They were sponsoring 140,000 children. March of 2017, after a year of investigation, they're kicked out of India. All these children left without help. And there's a rise of nationalism. You can go and Google uh, on the news, the things happening in India. Some of it make the news, most of it does not. I'm under investigation, and, uh, but we've not given up. God continues to bless the ministry. We have a Bible college, the only college. With a, you know, we have 
a, a diploma, a bachelor's, and now we started a master's in divinity. So it's a full-fledged only seminary affiliated to a Southern Baptist seminary. And then we are focusing, because of the persecution, we cannot do large events. I was telling Pastor William Campbell, I went to school at Southeastern in North Carolina with Billy Graham's grandson, Franklin's son, Will Graham, and we did a lot of crusades in India. You know, more than 50,000 people in one of the crusades. But we cannot do that anymore. So our strategy has changed. We are training 300 people we call Gideon's 300. Just like Gideon had a big army and this God said, no, I'm going to pick 300. And we are teaching them theology, leadership, church planting, and we believe they will continue the work in 13 states and more states to come. So we need a lot of prayer. I know a lot of ministries approach you, but the next year or two, if you were undergird is in prayer, and there is more information here with persecution growing, God has blessed this ministry. We are in more than 10 nations, Philippines, Thailand, Israel, Jordan. So all these places, we have trips. If you want to join us, then we go to, um, in South America, we go to Cuba, Peru, um, Brazil, and Ecuador. And Ecuador is a place we are looking at a permanent ministry, and uh, we are praying and that the Lord would uh, lead this church uh, also to be a part of that, and uh, so we can make a big impact. Roman Catholicism is like Hinduism. It's a very different type of uh, Catholicism in South America, meshed with the local religion, uh, very few evangelicals, and there are, we work with a missionary couple that are persecuted, but God is doing an amazing work. We have some children from Ecuador too. If you sponsor them, you can come and see them personally also. So please take a moment, go to the table. I guarantee you, you will beat the Presbyterians today <laughs> to the restaurant. <laughs> Pastor Campbell does that every Sunday, right? I want to share with you the Word of God, and um, I want to keep time. So I'm going to go fast. I'm going to give you a summarized version. By the way, there are a couple of pastors there from Cuba. We have work in Cuba, and I was supposed to go this week to Cuba, but because of the Venezuela, whatever situation is happening, you're not getting religious visas. But there are a couple of pastors there that really need our support. So if you feel like sponsoring them, those are available too in the back. The message on my heart this morning is our final victory. So going back to 1998, this was when the radical political party was in power and they were thrown out and they got reelected with a massive majority now. So they were in power and they were, the strategy was, you know, one of their you know, RSS, if you look at the ideology there, they say eliminate Christianity by 2021 in India. So in 98, they tried that. We had a conference, you know, one of the big things we do, our ministry focus, we work with children, we do church construction, we have constructed three churches in Ecuador, we do all those things, but our main focus is to train pastors, because these children that you saw, and other children in communities need leaders. Without leaders, you cannot have a long-term impact. So therefore, we are doing the core of the Great Commission. Jesus said, go make disciples. If you have disciples in every nation, tribe, and tongue, the community will be taken care of. Amen? So that's why he gave us the strategy, and that's why we are very focused on that. It's not glamorous. Pastors are, don't get sponsored because they are not cute as children. They tug on your heart. But we were training pastors, and we had about uh, 500 that we had invited, and we would bring top speakers from America, you know, and, um, and great conferences. People would line up. And this was 98, we didn't have any cell phones back then. About 150 extra pastors and their wives turned up. So we put them in a facility outside the main facility we were renting. We had great meetings all during the day, seminars in the evening. We had an evangelistic event and the radical groups, they go out in groups and are looking for Christian events, churches to attack. About 11 o'clock at night, after our pastors and their family went to sleep, 100 strong mob with sticks, chains, and belts came and barged open the door, pulled the pastors out of the bed, and began to beat them mercilessly. We heard the news, and my mom, she's Mama Bear, she said, children, you stay here. I was in India for the conference with a team from our seminary. Dr. Bill Bennett, the chaplain, was there. He's one of my mentors. So my mom said, you all stay in the house. Close the iron doors. We all have iron doors in India. I'm going to go help the pastors because they will treat a woman better than you all. So she went, and she saw these pastors being beaten up, and she went and pleaded with them. You know, why are you beating them? What crime have they done? And they spotted her and said, yeah, we know you are the leader. You bring people and train them so that they can convert more people to Christianity. She was arrested and taken into police station overnight. You don't want to be in a police station in India. It's extremely corrupt. 
and they harassed her all night. Imagine that. We got the news and said, you know, that my mom's arrested. She's going to spend the night in prison. We don't know when she's going to be released. And um, it was a crisis in our ministry. Why would that happen to us? Why would they leave everything in the South and serve the Lord, lose their daughter, and still go through these challenges? Why would you and I, we all face challenges in our life, and if we have a powerful and a great God, one of the big, biggest questions I had, I went to seminary to answer that problem of evil, but I came out with more questions. But we have the answer is, we trust in the sovereignty of God, amen? And that's the only thing we can do. That's the only thing that, can, that will unravel us and keep us strong. So we got together and, you know, you go to scripture and the scripture has answer. Because everything that happens to you, every challenge you face, and every persecution that has happened, it's not new, it has happened in the past. And when we go to scripture, and when we look at history and experiences, we will get encouraged by that, and we will continue to move forward knowing that we have the final victory. No challenge that we face has a final word for you. Someone said, here's the, here's the spoiler alert. We win at the end. Amen? We win. So we went to Acts chapter 4, and we saw the first church going through their first persecution. And that's in Acts chapter 4. That's a long text. Verses 1 to 31, but I'm going to highlight uh, a few verses and see how the reason for the persecution, reason for those challenges, how they responded, and the result. Are you ready? Here we go. The reason for the persecution is the exclusivity of the gospel. What happened to us happened to the early church. This was the first time the church was under attack. And why was it? If you read that chapter, the... Supreme Court of that time, the Sanhedrin called them in. He said, why are you preaching resurrection in the name of Jesus? Verse 1 hour was now, as they spoke to the people, the priests, the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees came upon them. Verse 2, being greatly disturbed that they taught the people and preached in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. That was their crime. Preach Jesus and his resurrection from the dead. And, and what they did, verse 3, they laid hands on them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. What happened to us exactly happened. You should never be caught with surprise if you know the Word of God and if you know history. All they could have done to stop persecution was quit preaching Jesus. If we just do what we do, help over 1,000 children in India and Nepal, We've drilled over 50 clean water wells. As we speak, three more water wells have been drilled in that community where there's a tremendous need. Hundreds of bicycles given, farm animals given to communities. If you do all that, they will give us an award, a medal for all the humanitarian work we do. And we love the world and we care for the world. But here's the problem. When you preach the gospel, when you preach Jesus, that's when they come and attack you. And guess what? We cannot do anything. I wish... I could say that all roads lead to Rome. All gods are same. But the scripture expressly, as we read in Acts 4.12, says there is no name under heaven given among men there whereby we can be saved except the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Tell me if there is any other Savior, who, uh, Jesus, the Son of God, who came into this world, lived a sinless life, died on the cross for our sins, was buried, and rose again from the dead on the third day. And he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. These are his words, and I'm bound by that. I wish I could say that all religion are the same. But there is only one Savior, and his name is Jesus. Amen? His name is Jesus. And you, if you've never accepted Christ as your Savior, he made the road so simple and so easy. He paid the price. He did the hard work. You know, that's why a lot of people say, you know, grace, simply receive it as a gift. It's powerful. Never trusted in Christ. I uh, hope you will do that today. The reason for the persecution and attack, even today, they call you narrow-minded and, you know, old-fashioned because if you hold on to Scripture and Jesus being the only way. The exclusivity of the gospel. Look at the response. How did they respond? They corporately prayed bold prayers, trusting in the sovereignty of God. Watch the scripture. Verse 23. Being let go, they went to their own companions and reported all that the chief priest and elders had said to them. So when they heard that, they raised their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, you are God who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them. 
So what they're doing here, the word they're using here is Lord, you are God, is used two or three times in the New Testament. What it signifies in the original language is God, you are absolutely in control, in charge. You are absolute master over all the course of events and history and circumstances that come upon all our lives. That's exactly what we need to do. We need to go to our own companions. I know this church believes in small group. And we need that, not just Sunday morning, where we can share our struggles. We can help each other along the way, cheer each other up, because we all face similar struggles. They went to their own companions, but not only that, they prayed bold prayers. Trusting in the sovereignty of God and the promises of God. Prayer is not to convince God or remind Him of His promises. Prayer doesn't change God. Prayer changes us. Because when circumstances hit us, financial problem, Hurricane Harvey, relationship struggles, sickness, persecution is a biggie. When it hits us, we begin to wonder, where is God? God is right where he has always been. And he's sovereign. And he has an eternal purpose for your life. Prayer reminds us of that. That we are not alone in this fight. That we are not forsaken. He's there in his eternal plan and purposes. And even the story of the Harvey Hurricane here is going to be used by God in great ways. Already is. He strengthened my faith last night. We were talking. And it will continue to, continue to strengthen and bless the nations of the world. The reason, the response, and look at the result. What happened when they responded right? 431. And when they had prayed, the place they were assembled together was shaken. Most Baptists would have run out of the building. <laughs> and they were all, watch this, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God with boldness. When you respond to circumstances right, trusting in the sovereignty of God, praying bold prayers, God gives you the best. And his best to them was not political power, more money in the bank. What God gave them was the third person of the Trinity who is with us. We need to be continuously not filled and controlled by our emotions and fears and circumstances. But when we pray, he fills us and gives us the boldness to continue to be a witness for Jesus. Let me take you quickly with a few minutes I have through a brief history. They say history is history and see how God moved all through history. We have the final victory. God's purposes cannot be defeated. So the church here, John MacArthur says, they were at a crossroads, like we were at a crossroads. Acts chapter 4, the first church. MacArthur says, all of future church history hinged on their response. If they responded wrong, if they would have packed their bags and said, hey, we're not going to do this anymore. We're going to go back to Galilee, fish a little, preach a little. We wouldn't have First Baptist Port Aransas. Christianity would have stopped right there. I'm glad they responded right. I'm glad you responded right and will continue to respond right. So the gospel, after this persecution, began to spread. More, more than 5,000 people joined the church. In Acts chapter 8, persecution comes. Whenever Christianity grows in any nation, it is persecuted. That's been the history. But in persecution, God had a purpose. He wanted to spread the gospel among the nations. Exactly what happened to them happened to us. Two years, you know, we've been under severe investigation, and God blessed us to spread this ministry over 10 nations of the world. Exactly what happened is happening to us. It's amazing how God is faithful. So the gospel goes, and there's a man called Saul who is bent on destroying Christianity. Riding his high horse, God brings him down, and the greatest persecutor of the church becomes the greater preacher of the gospel. You cannot win against God. God has a final victory. So the gospel goes through, through Paul into Rome, and as it began to grow, what happens? For the first three centuries, Christianity is under attack. 
under Nero, under Diocletian, Domitian, all these emperors, Christians were persecuted. Children were fed to wild beasts. They were burnt alive on the stakes. And they thought they would vanquish Christianity, but you cannot defeat God. Through the persecution, God was faithful. In the fourth century, the entire Rome became a Christian nation under Constantinople. You cannot win against God. But here's what happens. In adversity, Christianity grows, but watch out. Prosperity really brings apathy. And that's what we see in the history of the church. And the church goes through a dark period. The scripture is not preached anymore. But God said enough is enough. In the 16th century, he raises somebody called Martin Luther, the German reformer, the theologian. He says, we need to come back to scripture. We need to trust God and him alone for your salvation, not follow the dogma of the church, but the word of God. God raised somebody up to do that. Now, there was challenge, not only physical persecution. Like in America, there's an intellectual persecution happening in our schools and in our colleges, especially in our colleges, where Christianity is disdained and stamped upon and said it's old-fashioned. I mean, our kids go to college, their faith is destroyed. That's intellectual persecution. Ha started happening right after the Reformation, during the Renaissance and during the Enlightenment period. They began to say, we need to follow the reason that man has and uh, the philosophies that all these great philosophers came up with and say, hey, like philosophers like Voltaire, the French philosopher said, the Bible is going to be outdated in their lifetime. Guess what? We, have an, we are in electronic times. I still have my Bible on my iPad. You cannot stop the advance of the gospel. The industrial revelation, revolution and the scientific revolution. We had the optimism that we're going to, you know, cure all diseases and, you know, science is going to win and all that. And guess what? The two world wars showed that science left alone cannot help us conquer the evils of this world. In fact, they become a source of evil. If science and advancement is great, I love, as I said, FaceTime, and I can see my grandchild interact and see her smiling face. But if it's not undergirded with scripture, we can destroy ourselves. And during the two world wars, the industrial and scientific revolution showed that we could kill each other. And yes, by a press of a button, the world can be destroyed. God continued to be faithful to his church. 1998, I'm going back as I close. We were persecuted, but the next day, my mom was released on medical grounds. And I remember Sunday morning at the conference, we had a big celebration. We had a service that lasted three and a half hours. Most Baptists would have not survived. No water break. <laughs> Long story short, the pastors who had broken bones, their leg and cast, their hands and cast. We asked them to go back to the village, but they said, we came here for the conference, we're going to finish it. On the crutches that we, thank God we were counted worthy to suffer for Christ, we ended willing to lay down a life for Jesus. All heaven broke loose. My mom came and testified inside the prison she was threatened to deny Jesus or accept all the 330 million gods they worship as same as Jesus. And mom said, you can cut my throat, but I'll never take the name of another God in my mouth. Only Jesus saves. I remember the pastors on their knees, on the dirt ground. It was a rented place. We never had a place of our own. Cried out to God in a prayer. We asked for India. We call her by name. We asked not for riches. We asked not for gain. We asked for India in Jesus' name. Guess what? After 1998, what they meant for evil, God meant for good. More people started praying for us. More people started supporting our ministry. And all this expansion, you know, as I said, with the crusades that we did, the hundreds of pastors we trained, more than 2,000 house churches planted, happened after 1998 because you cannot stop the advance of God's work. As we look at our world today, amen, for the glory of God. ISIS crisis in the Middle East, Al-Qaeda is still out there, and there's political turmoil and animosity, cultural war going on. When we look all around us, you know, things that are happening, we were talking about in India and Russia and China and other places, you know, there can be fear upon our hearts, and I'm concerned about my grandchild and the future that we, they will have. And yes, we need to be politically active and do the best we can to make a difference in our world, but we got to realize that if we look at the circumstances of the world, we will be discouraged. But here Here's the, here's the encouraging hope that I want you to take home. That all of history, God is sovereign, and all of history is not moving towards some rogue nation or a rogue group getting a nuclear bomb and destroying the world. What I'm looking forward is 
when the time comes, when the last person that needs to come to Christ comes to know Christ, God is going to court, close the curtains of history. And all of history is moving in one direction. That's the coronation of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And therefore, the hymnist says, crown him King of Kings. Crown him Lord of Lords. Wonderful Counselor, Almighty God, Prince of Peace. And he shall reign. He shall reign. He shall reign forevermore. Yes, we have the final victory in Jesus' name. But here's the challenge. Here's the challenge. As we face all the challenges of today, can God count on us to be faithful? Will we say, Lord, I'll do everything I can to be faithful to my church. I'll do everything I can to take this gospel to the ends of the earth. I'll be faithful with my family and my children. Every head bowed, every eye closed. If that is your decision, I'm going to pray over you. Will you stand to your feet and say, yes, God, you can count on me in this generation to continue your work in America. The future of America is in our hands or in God's hand, but he counts on us and the future of the world. Will you stand with him? I'll pray for you. Father, you see us right now. Your church stands with you, for you, and for the gospel, and for the future that you have ordained. And with hope in our hearts, and by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, we will be faithful in Port Aransas and around the world, taking the gospel and ushering in the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. So strengthen your people. Whatever struggles they're going through right now, I pray that your outstretched hand will move and work on their behalf. Do mighty things for your glory in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Pastor William. Thank you, brother. Uh, he came in with a tie and coat. I told him, you better take that off. And so I know he's happy he did. He was able to move around a lot better. <laughs> so thank you for sharing so much. Um, I guess I'm going to have to drink more caffeine in the morning so that I can be a little more vocal like Finney. <laughs> I hope that you'll take a moment to go back to the table and see what is back there. Pray about if God wants you to sponsor some of those because we want to continue being active in missions and seeing God work in uh, other places. And we, we see what God is doing through AIM and Finney. So uh, pray about that. Uh, I'm going to lead us in prayer in just a second. Don't forget about small groups. There's got a list in the back. Of course, if you want to talk about more of what Finney just talked about, come on up to my office building right behind here. Go up the stairs. And you'll see me over there. I'd love to sit and talk with you for a little bit about any of that stuff or what God may have for you in your life. So let's pray. Father, thank you so much for how you love us. Thank you for what you are doing around the world. Lord, may this stir our hearts to be more engaged with people around us as well as to pray for what you want to do in our country. Lord, we know that there's so much strife and bitterness developing among people where there really shouldn't be. Lord, help us to stay focused on the gospel because you are our final victory. Jesus always wins. So, Father, help us to stay focused on Jesus and not allow Satan to distract us with all the stuff that's going on, but to be reminded of that you are Lord and you are God. Thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name, amen.